So welcome, um, my name is Ariel Julia Brown. This is our cohort of artists in residence from 2021 to 2022. Yes, 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 of black radical performance makers, like the ones you see in front of you. Um, these people are incredible thought leaders and um, in so many ways conjurers in their communities, um, nationally and for the world. And um, I just give thanks for the work that they do. Um, yes, 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 y'all can give them. So we are gathered for this moment just to get a, a taste, a little bit of an overview of each of their projects and work um, over the course of their residency. Um, in the course of their residency, they worked on a specific project. They worked with our dramaturgs in residence, Carlos Serra and Diane Xavier. Want to give love to the team. They worked across two collective cohort sessions um, and also individual sessions with this dramaturg um, as they were just really being in the work of um, community building around um, and kind of a sort of ciphering around the shape of their work. Uh, so today we're really just going to kind of get into some high level nuts and bolts around um, what that looked like, how that work continues to live and breathe and um, yeah, make, um, make space for us, those of us who are in the material and those of us who are in spirit. Um, so yeah, I, without further ado, we'll begin. My name is Awilda Sterling Dupre. My work develops in Puerto Rico, a Caribbean island where black women's art is silenced, especially in the context of abstraction in visual arts and dance. My practice in performance is an extension of my daily life, uncertainty, the underlying conditions of life in Puerto Rico, is a consistent platform for my work which sustains itself from precariousness, debris, and the ephemeral. Being an active senior female contemporary black artist, my installations and performances intertwine marginalities of self, representation, and resistance, confronting the silencing and invisibility of Afro-Caribbean women Working with multidisciplinary and feeding from Yoruba Caribbean traditions, I transgress the boundaries between drawing, painting, and performance through a decolonizing practice that challenges conventions in Puerto Rican fine arts and traditions. Abstract expressionism is at the core of my practice. Through it, I find a means of objectifying concerns about color, shadow, light and contrast as equivalents to particular states of being, which I then translate to the three-dimensionality of performative actions. Led by curiosity as a fine and good girl of Oshun, my mother, the aesthetic structure of my work is both fixed and improvised, nourished by elements and materials found, uprooted, or decadent. I'm strongly driven to gesture. Trained as a painter, I seek parallels in performative action. I like to think of my performing body as the move me, moving element in space, using three-dimensional space as an imaginary canvas. The plasticity of my movements align themselves ancestral embodiments and contemporary aesthetics values.
Hi, my name is Nikolai Mackenzie Ben Rima, and my piece is entitled Silsila. It is a part of the saltire cloud of works that are works in process that are sourced from ancestry research as well as personal reflections on my present as well as my ancestral past. Silsila in particular is a solo that is a transgenerational conversation between myself and my ancestor Nicholas, who's my second great grandfather. Um, I didn't grow up knowing any information about my father's side of the family, and when I was given a family tree by a distant ancestor, something that stuck out to me was at the center of the tree is this person named Nicholas who has a similar name to mine a name that means victory of the people, um, which will come in handy later. Um, I noticed that he is descended from both the enslaved and the enslaver, being the product of a marriage between those two seemingly disparate uh, and remote elements of British colonial society. I noticed that he died on the 20th of October and I was born on the 10th of February, which is the same numbers just transposed, which is a, a nice little baton handle off. <laughs> but all this to say, Silsila is an old man remembering how it felt to be young. Silsila is a young man raging against impending age. Silsila is also an infant with brand new discoveries all around them. And the piece in an ideal world will keep going, just as the name implies. The name Silsila in Arabic means a linkage in a chain or a lineage or a tradition. You can see that by the the way that the word is structured, sil, sil, is the same syllable twice, as in two links in a chain. And a ah implies imminence, and that it will go on forever, sil, sila. And so, tracking with my own personal belief that we get reincarnated through our bloodlines, I believe that I am sil, sila. I, I am a sil, sila of Nicholas. I am a linkage, I am a tether, I am a, a conduit, I am... I'm somehow so closely attached to him. Um, I find myself incarnated in almost similar circumstances, whereas my two parents are from two ends of the Jamaican social strata and how there are gaps in the information that I have about Nicholas. His parents didn't get married until years after he was born after which they had many children. So what was it that prevented that from happening? I myself wasn't allowed to speak to my father for many, many years. Um, and I'm in the process of reacclimating myself to a family that I wasn't uh, made privy to, even though that's my birthright. I feel like a similar thing might have happened to Nicholas at the time, being that he was born before emancipation uh, or Vaguely, maybe there were some legal things, um, but that's all to say that all of the memories that I somehow have of things that I have never physically seen, all of the inklings that I have, all of the predilections that I can't really pinpoint as to why I have them, I feel like they come from him. And I feel like he's revealing to me mysteries as I continue to deepen my journey as, a, as an artist. I found Nicholas's death certificate on the internet in my research and it says in very ornate handwriting under occupation it says cultivator and of course that means he was a farmer or he was a, a pen keeper, a land uh, keeper, um, but Nicholas also had a brood of 12 children with a woman whose parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents were also enslaved by Nicholas's father's family. So I feel like he was not only a cultivator of the land, but a cultivator of minds, 
I aspire to, oh I, I, I envision him ha as having uh, a revolutionary sort of view of the future of his country simply because he existed at a crossroads between two very different worlds. And I was born in a place called Crossroads in Kingston, in St. Andrew, whose symbol is the St. Andrew's Cross, the St. Andrew's Saltire, which is the same image that you see in the Jamaican flag as well as the Scottish flag, as well as the flag of Spain, which flew over Jamaica before the English took it. So I named my greater span of work Saltire because for many, many generations, um, my ancestors have been looking up at a salt tire wherever they, wherever they might have been, especially on the island of Jamaica itself. Um, yeah, Silsila is meaningful to me because it is an ongoing conversation about belonging and and identity and birthright and distance and closeness to our creators and how sometimes we have to be the cultivators of our own garden um, irrespective of what or how we were planted. Mm. My work called Where is Farin is an extension of Silsila as in if Silsila is a retrospective or it's a fast forward and retrospective going in between present and past and maybe future, where is far and is very much present. Um, and it reflects the need of many Jamaicans who feel trapped on the island. It reflects a need for them to want to f experience something other than, than Jamaica itself. One of my cousins who came up to the States recently found himself in my backyard in Virginia, looking around and just saying out loud, where is Farin? As in like, where am I? Like, where is this? So this place that I've been thinking about and, you know, everybody around me vaunts as this place where, you know, mm. gold falls from the ceiling, you know, where is it? Where exactly is it and what is it? And what I'm, dealing with in where is far in is that mood of anywhere is better than here anywhere is better than than the suffering that a lot of jamaicans are meant to endure um and you know there must not be any corruption there you know there must not be any injustice there must not be the stain of colonialism there only to come here to the states and find that it is everywhere and that you might have been better off cultivating your own garden um, but it's also a reflective of my own aspirations about what I would love for all Jamaicans is to free ourselves of colonial mindsets wherever we may be whether it be on the island or in the diaspora there's something new about the future and I I, I hope to be in the company of folks oh. like the folks in the Black Spatial Relics cohorts who are future-minded and, and have a different vision of what Black liberation is. Um, I say there's a line in Where is Far and We never see such new things yet. And what I mean by that is not just the material things that one finds when the conveniences that one finds when you come off far end, but also, I've never seen the opportunity or the the chance for such such clean slateness when it comes to um, the Jamaican experience. So I hope that you enjoy what you see and that my oh. research and that my findings and that my digging oh. and my reflecting can... Oh incite you to cultivate your own garden as well. Hello, Ariel, welcome. So hi, everyone. It's an honor to be here this morning. Um, 
just a few meditations I, I would like to share about my project that was called Ecologic. Um, it looked at the life and times of a, a revolutionary spiritual woman um, who led a community of about 30, just about 40 odd people um, in a, uh, a remote area near the coastline in Trinidad and Tobago. This was happening in the 1970s. Um, and Ari Ariel, can, can we ask you to hold? We have just like one request. Um, is, 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 it, is it at all possible for you to be on camera? I am not. You are not currently on camera. I thought I was. I thought I was. Oh, good. Oh, good. Hello. Hello. I really thought I was. My bad. Can we pin her? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm looking at this screen. Yeah. How she carried about herself, 
um, she was questioned, her sanity was questioned. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it so happened that the anthropologist was also a, like a qualified psychologist and conducted tests um, on her mm -hmm. and members mm -hmm. of the community. And according to his, you know, we'll call it the European standard, um, I think it was a, a it was some kind of um, standardized testing for, for sanity, let's put it that way. Okay. I can't find a better way to frame it. Um, and she was found to be very much okay. She was, you know, she checked all the boxes and she was a, a, a well-functioning member of, of society and space. So even that was a very interesting thing because locals, people um, in a nearby village, people at the national level, you know, had already discarded her as yeah. and her people as, as not being seen. Um, a few more things, because I know five minutes tends to run very quickly. Um, what is the evolution of the relationships that you have with people? Um, when you decide to choose freedom for yourself, how do people view you? How are you now viewing them? There's a kind of othering that happens in that space. And, and how do you make peace with those changes in, in relationships? Um, I was looking at the idea of abandonment. How much are you living to abandon? I mean, um, there was this this really interesting part of the story where she took everything in the house, right, and set it aflame in the backyard. Excuse me, all I need to see. Um, set it aflame in the backyard and just threw away everything for her that represented Western living, right? So, what are the things that you're abandoning, and how harsh, or how cool, or how easy um, are those abandonments happening um, in the name of your freedom? And uh, finally, I guess I can talk about protecting your purpose. Um, if you feel within your heart space that you're being called to something, you're being called to live in a particular way, um, how do you guard, stand guard for your purpose? How do you um, perhaps uh, hedge, put a hedge, put safety around something that you alone might understand in a moment? that people um, may not be able to hold a vision with you. And, mm -hmm. and even even in that case, some people might be able to hold it to a point and then beyond that, no more, mm -hmm. right? So these are some of the questions that came up for me um, as a person visiting Mother Earth and her own narrative and finding the intersections within my own and that of my, my people and my kids. Right. Yeah. So I hope that this, um, yeah. this was aligned in some way with the intention of these moments, and um, thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. Yes. Here I have Izzy Espinosa. Hello, the share about your work. Yeah, um, so when Ariel asked us a couple framing questions this morning, uh, she mentioned Susan Laurie Parks, and uh, when I was talking about this play with some undergrads recently, uh, Susan Laurie Parks was the bridge, so I thought I'd share some of the quotes that came into that space and then go into the work a little more. Uh, so this is from Susan Laurie Parks' Possession. Uh, some of the things that she asks and says, Who do I write for to answer myself that gets another question that is, who am I? Another quote that felt really resonant is, Theater is the place which best allows me to figure out how the world works. Mm -hmm. um, she says that a play is a blueprint of an event, a way of creating and rewriting history through the medium of literature. Since history is a recorded or remembered event, theater for me is the perfect place to make history. That is because so much of African American history has been unrecorded, dismembered, washed out. One of my tasks as playwright is to, through literature, and the special strange relationship between theater and real life. Locate the ancestral burial ground, dig for bones, find bones, hear the bones sing, write it down. Mm -hmm. Which I think is what you exactly quoted this morning. Um, and then the last quote I'll share is, I'm working theater like an incubator to create new historical events. Um, that felt like a great bridge. I'm gonna kinda use this as like a preamble for this afternoon, um, so it's a little more fluid, but I'm going to start by just reading what appeared as part of the program note for the production that was recently in the world, um, and helps kind of frame the play. Uh, in 1552, Miguel de Buria, a black man born in what is known as Puerto Rico, established a new nation within the country of Venezuela. 
staging the first successful African rebellion there. He established a royal lineage with his wife, Guillomar. The nation lasted for two years before being overcome by the colonizing Spanish. Miguel and his wife, Guillomar, have persisted as folk heroes in the Afro-Venezuelan community. When watching this performance, it's important to know that Guillomar is a fact-based historical figure. It is also important to know that there were countless other people just like Guillomar throughout the Spanish-speaking African diaspora who have begotten hundreds of thousands of descendants. This play is for all of them, and for this reason, there is no specific country where it takes place. This play takes place in a time similar to our own, where black people are searching for ways to live liberatory lives in the face of systemic inequity and state violence. This play takes place in a world where, like our own, black people have turned to the spirit world of their ancestors. Cosmology is governed by the Yoruba Orishas to look for possible ways forward. While the people in this play turn towards these spirits, the rituals they perform are their own, specific to the world of the play and the imagination and offerings of the creative team. As Octavia Butler writes in Wild Seed, you cannot know how well people's bodies remember their ancestors. Mm -hmm. This play is a remembering of things never known, an offering in the face of rupture and erasure. Um, and I guess with the remaining time, I'll just add a couple things, which is that um, when I think about where this play came from for me and what Black Spatial Relics has come to mean as we've shared space together and this question of the maroon, um, the maroon concept is so central because that is the word that was applied to Miguel de Boria. Um, and I think for me, it's so interesting to think about the maroon identity and fugitivity and directions and what changes over time in that in the 1500s, this is a person who left a space, and I feel like to make this play, I, I had to chase a space. Mm -hmm. um, and so what fugitivity means for us today is just so, it's a different direction. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that in the making of the play, and I'll get more into this in the afternoon, it was really an understanding of how a container for my ancestry becomes a container for a collective ancestry, um, and how to, caretake in that space. Um, I was talking to Ariel earlier about result versus process and, and what is our responsibility to hold as artists. Um, and it kind of feels like it's all our responsibility. Um, so I've done a lot of reflecting on what the form of theater asks of us and, and how to start creating work that has that caretaking in its in its premise um, rather than just in its result. Mm -hmm. um, some of the ways that showed up for this, um, it was very clear. I always wrote this play in a kind of loosely bilingual fashion, um, kind of holding emotional realities of language and kind of switching when it felt right to switch. Mm -hmm. um, the more I worked with actors, the more I realized that one of the character tracks um, attracted actors whose native language was not English, and so it just had to be rewritten. Um, and so I rewrote it, which was hard, and it was exciting because it really opened the play up even more. I think offering language as specificity meant that even the responses in English turned into more specificity. Um, but to get into this in the afternoon, because I saw my time, <laughs> um, it, it also was a big caretaking question because we are operating in scarcity in a lot of different ways in the making of theater in this country and the actor who would have played the role did not have the right visa to be paid mm -hmm. legally mm -hmm. and there was a very administrative and institutional immediate response that mm -hmm. felt out of my hands and felt violent in some ways of losing a collaborator based on paperwork, based on timing, based on urgency, and then working with someone who has my shared background with Spanish, which is, it's a language that I chase, that I ran from as a child and I chase now. And so I watched someone have to memorize a lot of Spanish. And I watched someone who is not a trained actor 
commit to this role because of their mm -hmm. commitment to the collective ancestral space mm -hmm. and and watched an institution not be prepared for caretaking. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think I'm still holding what that means in terms of result and, and what this turned into in the in the world because I'm really happy with the audience reception and, and the fact that I heard what I needed to hear from audience members, that this held them, that there was space for their own healing in watching it, um, but I'm still wondering about the ways that we caretake during process. Mm -hmm. So, more on that in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes, here we have Sonia Dumas. Thank you, thank you so much. My project centers around the Middle Passage and memory of the Middle Passage, but specifically because I come from a place of dance and movement and movement observation. It comes from a sort of wanting to know what vestiges of movement remain in our bodies, and not just black bodies, anybody in Trinidad and Tobago but maybe from the African experience of coming over in the Middle Passage. What remains in our bodies as somatic engagements with terror mm -hmm. that now allow us to move in a certain way and survive, okay, both then and now. None of us was alive when the Middle Passage happened, but what is it in our bodies that survives that? and lives in our bodies because of that, because of that moment. When, you're, when physically you're bound um, and so your body doesn't have a lot of room to maneuver, your mind starts to act in a different way. And that's really what somatics is all about. It's a sort of mind-body connection. And what happens is that your mind starts to inform your body and vice versa, but first from the mind, to say, okay, well, do this, as a point of survival, and then do this as a point of healing. And that's when we start to get these habits that we perhaps have as we move through space. So it's not just about dance, which is something maybe more in the performing arts area, what have you. It's about movement. How do I sit? How do I stand? How do I move through a crowd? Okay. Um, so I'm looking at certain movements, like for instance, and I, I'm kind of locating it in Trinidad and Tobago, because if I was trying to do the whole of the Caribbean, I don't think I have enough lifetime to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, and even Trinidad and Tobago is going to be difficult, because even Trinidad and Tobago mm -hmm. are different, mm -hmm. right? because their histories are different. And um, for instance, when we raise our hands in the air, it's usually in a festive mode. Right? Um, and I notice that other countries in the Caribbean don't do that in the way that we do that. Mm -hmm. So what is Trinidadian about it and where did it come from? It could <coughs> even come from India because India, we have a lot of Indian immigrants that came as well and under indentureship. Mm -hmm. And so I have to sort of discover, did it come from there or did it come from having to, you know, being free on the ship on some level and being able to stretch your arms out. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's all you could have done. We don't know. Um, and so the question remains now, why would I try to do something so nuanced and so almost inaccessible? And the answer is, maybe I will find something, I'm the eternal optimist, right? Um, but it's also about not just dwelling on the trauma, but it's dwelling on the resilience and the resistance and the, and the way to survive mentally, emotionally, physically, socially, what have you. What is it that we have now? That what, where, where is that strength coming from? Did that, did that strength come from some somatic decisions that our ancestors mm. made? Mm. And so that's basically what I'm kind of doing. And I'm, I'm loving every minute of it. It's not easy, but <laughs> that's kind of what I was investigating in this, in this, um, this lovely space of black spatial relics. Mm. Mm. Thank you. I'm Candice DeMeza, and uh, my project is called Whale, and it is uh, centered around the Sugarland 95, which is outside of uh, Houston in the suburbs of a city now called Sugarland. Uh, 95 bodies were unearthed mm. in 2018, and it was found that they were convict leased inmates mm. between 1877 and 1912. This convict leasing system that replaced enslavement, which actually 
um, I came quickly to learn was even more brutal than enslavement. Mm -hmm. It was a hundred percent profit. Mm -hmm. um, whereas when you have uh, humans owning other humans, there's this kind of feel where you don't want to kill them because you lose money. But when they're owned by this the state, there that doesn't even exist. It was a very brutal system, and um, and so with this discovery of these bodies. A lot of Houstonians don't even know that this history is like right outside the city limits. There isn't a lot of real engagement with it. And so at the time I started, the seed of this idea comes from, I was studying with um, Maladoma Somme, who has recently transitioned to Gara, shaman and elder. And during ritual, um, I had an interesting conversation while I was married of Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, that was fun. And... <laughs> Um, where the earth, uh, this experience of like, as I was waiting to be like, cool, like what, what you got to say, cause I'm here. Uh, and she laughed and she laughed and mm -hmm. I was like, what are we laughing at? Mm -hmm. And it was this feeling like I'm the last arbiter of justice. Mm -hmm. Nobody gets past me, mm -hmm. which was, ooh, that really caught me. Um, and then I thought about um, being raised in a Christian household. I thought about in Jeremiah this concept of like the wailing women. Mm -hmm. Like when something has occurred, a travesty against the earth, like the earth grieves, but it holds it. And then I thought, like, where are the wailing women that come and wail about these things that happened? And uh, Maladoma Somme talks a lot about in the West the absence of Greek rituals presents mm -hmm. itself as this um, anger and hatred and. Um, and we're just riddled with it because we have no place to grieve and release. Um, and it's a mandate in their culture. Everybody must shed water. Like, you have to mm -hmm. um, grieve. You have to for the culture, for, mm -hmm. for healing, for wholeness. Um, and so I took that and I uh, used the Dagara cosmology, which is five elements of mineral, earth, um, mineral, earth, nature, fire, which represents ancestors, and water. So I had um, five of us embodied those different, like, cosmological ah! elements. Okay. There's an ad. Okay. Uh. <laughs> you got to skip ads. That's the right response. <laughs> it's, it's an analogy for <laughs> But um, I just wanted to think about how these different elements might... Uh, grieve as if we were like a court, right? Like an um, ancestral kind of primordial court that was on the site. We performed on the site. It was recorded also because of um, COVID kind of research at the time, so it had to adapt to be digital. Um, but just um, how might we have funeral and have court to be like, this occurred here, we're declaring this guilty. Like, we are saying there's guilt here, there's blood here, and we're condemning it as these different elements. And then in time with the elements, uh, funerary traditions. Mm. So um, the funerary traditions of Jamaica and Haiti because of the connection to sugar and sugar cane. So mm. the convict lease inmates were uh, boosting the sugar, the sugar, in, the sugar industry. Uh, Imperial Sugar, which is still around, mm. the, is the company. Um, and then the Congo people, because there was Congo crosses found in some of the sugar mills in the region, mm. Um, which they were, um, the enslaved people were doing to basically ward off evil. So we integrated that, and then of uh, uh, southern traditions. So integrating these different also elements visually and in the language about the funeral traditions of these different peoples in this. Um, the silences that were excavated was, so the site is essentially owned by a school district which is horrid, it's horribly traumatic. This, mm. It's continuing the process of even getting the work done. There were so many blockages. Like in the spirit realm, it was blocks on blocks on blocks. And the land is still currently in contention where the grassroots activists and descending communities are basically locked out. Mm -hmm. The narrative is controlled by, um, was then controlled by a superintendent who was white and... Um, I don't, they're just getting to profit off of this narrative. It's a really horrendous situation. So it became also this documentary and interviewing um, some of the other grassroots activists about like what has happened and letting them say on record 
whatever they wanted to say about the school district because there isn't that actual engagement. Mm -hmm. Nobody's really asked them. Um, so the, the issue is still ongoing and um, the school district did, does not like my project. Uh, but that's fine. Um, and how has it changed me? I don't know. I think it's still ongoing. We have an upcoming screening, still still working and trying to see how this project can boost the grassroots organizers to do their next level of work. How can we create more conversation? Um, I'm not sure. I just It's just a contemporary issue with um, how descendant communities are locked out of their own land issues for their own ancestors. It's really traumatic and I still feel like there's still just a lot of grief around it, but also trying to make more space for joy because so much of my work is really heavy, um, <laughs> which is hard to hold. Um, so, uh, yes, that is whale. Hey, y'all. Hey. My name is Monet Noel Marshall. Um, and my pronouns are she, her. And I, my project is really about how do we take these historic sites, these explicit sites of slavery, i.e. plantation spaces, and make them healing sites for black people. So I am working with Historic Stagville, which is, was the largest plantation in North Carolina. At Emancipation, there were over a thousand people enslaved there. And those folks went and they seeded and started the black communities in Raleigh and Durham and Chapel Hill and beyond. Um, and so many of their descendants are still there. Like, it's really hard to, like, you could throw a rock, you're going to hit a stack of descendants, whether they know it or not. Mm -hmm. um, and I had been doing work with plantations for several years before that, creating an interactive and immersive presentation with my family-run theater company uh, with my mama uh, and just like seeing the impact of what happens when folks get to not just like listen to the history or like but like you know like they have to activate their bodies they got to move through space you got to like you know come clean these potatoes okay now we're gonna go sit in this church you're gonna hear this message of domination like and then escape together you know what I'm saying like this is what this um so we did that for years and we like led over a thousand people through this like uh, experience. And then Stagwell reached out and I just felt really clear that that's not what that space needed. Mm -hmm. What the space needs is like a practice that's grounded in baby suck sermon mm -hmm. from Beloved. Mm -hmm. I'm like, come to this land mm -hmm. and like laugh mm -hmm. and cry and mm -hmm. dance. Mm -hmm. And it's also really grounded in the brilliance of Harriet Tubman, right? literacies that are beyond literature, so like mm -hmm. how we read stars and plants mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. bird calls, um, and how do we find our trusted allies, right? Because Harriet trust, trusted John Brown. She's like, I don't know about the rest of y'all white people, but she found her people. Right. So how do we find our trusted allies? And how do we learn how to rest? How mm -hmm. is sleeping and dreaming part of our liberatory practice? Mm -hmm. So I'm in a legacy relationship mm -hmm. with Stackville in which I <laughs> I laid out like here's what I want to do. I want to mm -hmm. trouble the archive. I want to go mm -hmm. in and I want to look for holes like Susan Lloyd Parks. Mm -hmm. I want to look for holes and I want, because I'm an artist and not an anthropologist or an archaeologist, I can say things and make things mm -hmm. and like it's really like who going to check you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just a little bit of like history. The American Doll, the Addie, She's based on someone who was enslaved at Stagville. Mm. Wow. That, like, her mm. mother escaped Stagville mm. and was sending her child a letter back to the plantation, and that letter got intercepted. And that's mm. how that letter became part of the archive. Mm. And that's, like, that child is inspires that doll, right? So how do we do more of that? I mean, there's just so many stories that Stag they kept impeccable records. Um, White folks really love themselves, yeah. um, but don't know how to love themselves. Mm -hmm. um, they love their own existence, mm -hmm. the idea of it. And so there's a lot of gifts inside the archive, so that's one. 
two, to have a suite of programs that are black only. Um, mm -hmm. And again, grounded in this like, what, you, what we gonna do together? We gonna forage. Mm -hmm. We're gonna like lay out on the grass and look at the stars and like talk about stars. We're gonna just like come have a meal on the land. We're gonna eat food, we're gonna dance. Mm -hmm. We're gonna like have a fish fry. Mm -hmm. We're gonna take naps and wake up and be like, what you dream about? Mm -hmm. Like, this is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And the, I, I really um, empathize mm -hmm. with some of the challenges you're feeling because it is a state-owned property and has mm -hmm. been since the 1970s. And because of that, I have to have a workaround because I cannot do black-only programming mm -hmm. on this plantation because that would be discriminating against people of the state. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So, working around that as well. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, how do we shift the way that uh, the docent program works, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, on staff, they have one black woman, one white woman, and this one white man uh, who is the groundskeeper, which... Um, it's just different when it's a state job with state benefits, is all I'm going to say. Um, and, but they don't have the capacity. I was like, oh, actually, <laughs> uh, I, I really wish the docents looked like uh, Captain Planet. You know what I'm saying? Like, how could everyone, everyone has a story inside of this plantation story. If you are living in this country, there's a, there's a story here for you. And how can we tell a fuller story around how plantation history, how slavery is it? Explicit sites of slavery impact everyone's relationship to this land. Mm -hmm. How do we bring in, like, you know, Asian American folks? How do we bring in, like, the next folks? Like, and, and to say, like, you don't need to tell the black story. Yeah. You get to tell your story mm -hmm. with us in it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's, there's a dream around that. And then the, the, the last dream is this Freedom Fund. I want there to be a fund that is held in partnership with the space, not through the state, but with the foundation side, mm -hmm. where descendants can always show up and be like, I have an idea. And they're like, write your name down, just write one sentence, we're gonna cut you a check. Mm -hmm. Right? That's, that black folks in the community can do the same thing, and that indigenous <laughs> folks in our community can do the same thing. But there is just money, because we deserve to just go and like, I have an idea, or I don't have an idea, I need a thing. Mm -hmm. right? I want a thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there can just be resources that are like readily available for that. Um, so, where we are in the process right now is as we are learning how to even find the right, right language so that we can get the essence of the things mm -hmm. we want to do and also find the resources because we have lots of state sites. Stackville is the only one that is um, committed to telling the story of enslaved people and is often underfunded and we wonder mm -hmm. why. Mm -hmm. Because it's not doing the school trips to talk about the master's family. Because they're not doing the school trips and come pick cotton on the mm -hmm. land. Mm -hmm. They don't get the same amount of resources. Mm -hmm. um, we are working on a reflection space behind Horton Grove. So right here you'll see Horton Grove. There's three houses. What you don't see on the other side is another house. And it's the Hart House. The Hart's are a family and they lived in that house until the 60s. From 1865 to 1965, mm -hmm. there was a family still living in the same property on this land. Mm -hmm. So, and then you see this chimney right here. So that's a close-up. And those fingerprints, you can go up and touch them, are the fingerprints of the people who made those bricks. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So, behind this house, there's a grove. And out in that grove, they've cleared it. And we are making spaces to meet and gather. Like, yeah. to just sit with the history. Yeah. Just sit here. There's no, there's no like... Uh, programming. That's right. We're mm -hmm. just like making a place to sit by yourself or sit with three people or sit with ten people mm -hmm. and just be. Um, and I will say that the, the thing that has changed or confirmed for me is how important it is to not just invite people, but actually say, I'm, I'm doing the labor, but you're leading this work mm -hmm. because I'm surrounded by descendants. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we did when we started this project was gather descendants. And that gathering was the largest gathering of descendants that they had on the land. Mm -hmm. Ooh. And what I told them was like, I'm not going to do a project in your grandma's backyard without your permission. Mm -hmm. So tell me what you want. Tell me what you want to see and what you want to feel. And they told us. So that's been the grounding of the work. Um, and I really love it. And I'm grateful um, to do this work. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So moved by all of your work. I'm so moved by all of your work. Um, 
I think that I have a couple of questions for you. And then I also really just want to open up some space for you all to ask questions of each other. There are so many intersections in your work that you already began to point to, and I want to I want to hear y'all talk, talk amongst yourselves. So I'll ask my question and, and we can move. Um, so first I want to ask, and you all, some of you all really were getting into this. I want to first ask um, how you understand um, dramaturgy in your work um, and lifting dramaturgy as um, many ways of, of engaging many ways of knowing, knowing in the body, knowing in land, knowing in spirit, um, knowing from the archive, from, from repertoires of, 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 of performance um, and, and somatic memory. Um, and also um, other texts, other um, beings that you are in conversation with around this work. Um, you also were in conversation with, with Carlos Serra and Diane Xavier. Um, I want to lift, um, lift them um, and how, what those intersections look like. Um, yeah, and, and, and then finally, we often talk about um, the work of critical fabulation and um, Sadia Hartman's um, work with really also so so alongside this naming this lifting that Susan Lloyd Parks um, is offering about listening to the bone sing um, and 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 working with silences um, and absences in the archive. Um, so yeah, wanna wanna just throw that up and and see what lands for you that you want to share about your process. Well, and we can popcorn. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, I think that that whole Sadia Hartman thing is one of my inspirations because what she talks about is critical fabulation and speculative history, which is basically what I'm trying to investigate um, because there's very little tactile or documentary evidence of what I'm trying to do. Um, so that it, it then behooves me to, to, to try and imagine a world and to create ecosystems that people can respond to so, so that I can sort of respond in return and understand maybe a little more about how people move. So that um, I had, in terms of dramaturgy, what I, what I find is that I like to, it's an iterative process for me. So what happens is that I create something or the beginnings of something and then I have a dramaturg come and comment like having another eye on it that hasn't really been in the process which is very useful to me because sometimes it's, you know, in the forest you can't see the trees and um, so that I think that was very useful with Diane to, she, would, she would ask me certain questions or she would uh, based on our conversation she would send me some publications or you know, other documentation that might help you'd suggest that kind of thing, and that's always really, really valuable. Um, but in terms, coming back to that whole um, creating of an ecosystem, that's what I kind of did with the exhibition that I mounted. It was an installation that was immersive, and um, I think that was one of my ways in trying to, um, to get people to respond to the idea of this little passage without having actually lived it. Um, and um, to see what they did and how they were, and, and I had people write stuff as well. There was a book where they could write their responses about how they felt. And it was very, very interesting for me to see what they felt. Um, I don't know if that gets me closer to what the people on the ships felt, but it certainly gives me an idea of how people will respond to that kind of immersive environment in this, in this here and now and then you can get that a platform to, to move to history to come forward. I have a follow-up question real quick. Um, Sonia, I know that um, your work flooded. And when that happened, you were kind of emailing us in conversation about, um, yeah, spir in spirit, what was coming up for you around that. That was fascinating because what happened is I, I, I put up the installation. I had to come to the United States to do something. So I set it up, I think a couple of days after I left. And then we were supposed to create the artist talk when I returned. So I called the gallery owner and I said to him, 
well, okay, um, I'm settled in New York now, so I'm kind of done most of what I have to do. Let's talk about the, the um, artist talking that you want to have it. So I just thought I was having an administrative conversation with him. Mm -hmm. And he said, I have to tell you something. We have to close the exhibition. I'm like, we have to close the exhibition. It just started. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. And he said, because water mysteriously appeared, mm -hmm. they could not find the source of this water. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. <laughs> It flooded the entire exhibition. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. There was about an inch of water in the entire exhibition. Wow. So I said to him, send me pictures. Mm -hmm. Because <laughs> I know that ain't us, because that's right. another realm. That's right. <laughs> that's right. And I, um, no, I didn't do any, any um, sort of libations or anything. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it wasn't a, a question of me having called any spirits or anything like that. But I certainly felt that that was what it was. And um, they still couldn't find it. It flooded once, a little bit, and then it flooded a whole lot. And mm -hmm. that's when the one inch of water in this perhaps maybe 20 by 35 space, foot space. Mm -hmm. When he sent me the pictures, now the installation is a series of fabric, um, strips of fabric about maybe 36 inches wide or whatever but they're, they're sort of draped in the space to make it look like water. Right? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, when I saw the picture, because of the reflection and refraction of light, it made it look twice as deep. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, I couldn't have wow. planned that. <laughs> right? And, um, so I had a couple of discussions with a, a couple of friends of mine who are close to the Orisha practice. And because a lot of my work has to do with water, and I've, I've done work with, um, you know, with Yemanja as a center and, and so forth, and I'm writing a screenplay now with both Yemanja and um, Olokun. So, but I'm not a practitioner. But I dance, it's in my body somewhere, right? and uh, in the bodies of people that I work with. So, and they said, well, figure it out. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, so what I did is I, at the same artist talk, I, or I, I just offered some, you know, I had a little plate of offerings. So that was my, that was my contribution to it. But I just thought it was an absolute, mm. I was thrilled. I was thrilled that they came, that they clearly enjoyed it. They finally found, the gallery finally found the, um, the source of the water like two weeks after, mm. which was actually on another property where they had done some bad plumbing or whatever it was. But they, it literally seeped through the walls, wow. right? Mm. Mm. And um, the gallery owner, um, he, was a, he was Trinidadian, and now interestingly enough, he's a Trinidadian of European descent. Mm. And he said, he, whenever he came down to the exhibition, he said he would feel something that he never felt before in the space, and he's had the space for like 15 years or whatever mm. it is, right? And um, I just wondered if they were talking to certain people in the community, you know, the, they meaning the spirits, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that they, were, that they were trying to tell them something, mm -hmm. right? He's a wonderful person, he's beautiful, right? He gave me the whole space for free and everything. But I just wondered if there was a conversation, a cosmic conversation mm -hmm. that was happening, a cosmic communication, mm -hmm. you know, in that, in that way. So yeah, that's what, that's mm -hmm. my story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> right? I know. Mean, I know. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I can talk a little bit about um, some of the really valuable things that Diane kind of put in mind for me. I just was reading over my notes from our last Zoom together, uh, kind of prepping for, for today, and the thing I wrote down was, what is something you need to know about your ancestor that you don't know, now you know it, mm -hmm. and just kind of giving those of us whose ancestry has rupture in it, in terms of knowledge, the, the power to decide that we know, mm -hmm. um, and the momentum that gave me. Um, and I think that this is kind of our conversation from dinner last night, too, about this question of knowledge and, and how we kind of mediate knowledge and just what happens when 
yeah, you just decide you know, right? Um, and that's essentially really the, the, the dramaturgy of the piece, that because I took this historical figure, Guillaume, and just thought of her as my ancestor, and then allowed that for my characters as well, and I think that um, my work with Diane just like, yeah, it just helped me know that, that this can be the vehicle. Um, and we also talked a lot about this question of caretaking, and I think the thing that Diane prepped me for was accepting personal boundaries, and, and knowing that, you know, it can be both and, that there can be institutional violence and the peace can still offer people what they need it to be. Um, the way that feels, I'm like, is it a both and? Like, I'm still kind of holding that, but I think that it was really helpful to go into the process already knowing that, you know, I can only hold so much and that I have to take care of myself too and my spirit. Um, and I think that in some ways you can lead by example with that work and, and it helps other folks with their boundaries, right? Um, and then I think uh, the last thing I'll say in terms of dramaturgy, and I'll talk more about this in the afternoon, is just building scripts that are porous and where there is space for future collaborators' input. And so that really showed up in kind of like the extra textual extra textual moments of like, I kind of wrote, okay, and, and here we will have a chant to Yamaya, or in here we will have a chant to Oya. And like people had in their own practices and with their own families had access to stuff that just worked so well dramaturgically that by the end of our process together, it really did feel more co-authored mm. than, than just from me. Um, mm. And... Yeah, so I, Diane was like in the in the space with the piece in a lot of helpful ways. Um, I hope it's okay to share this. Um, um, Diane, some years ago, we were having a conversation, um, and she's really thinking about, um, I believe Sylvia Winter's work with the plantation model, and thinking about the. Um, how that shows up in the American theater and the shapes of how labor yeah. is broken down, who does what labor, um, and how that really kind of lays out a, a foundation for violence to happen in, those, in, in rooms um, and in process. And I love hearing all of the ways in which like you um, held a space that um, offered a space in the, in the text that could become collaborative, co-authored, um, that in so many ways formally disrupts, structurally disrupts that process. Yeah, just want to reflect that. that. And give thanks for Diane and Vivian. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. I can jump in. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like my relationship to dramaturgy in this process is um, how do we rematriate? The archive. I feel deeply mothered by this work, and I feel myself also trying. I, I feel deeply mothered. I feel, <laughs> and I think some of the elements that are mothering me and, and shaping the dramaturgy the most are is the land. Like actually watching this particular grove move through each season, and know that I'm we are building something that's public art permanent, which is ten years. And so, how does something live throughout seasons in, in that way? and being responsive to the land and not trying to make it something other than what it is. Um, because really moving inside of a deep trust that in Horton Grove, which if you ever have a chance to visit, come, like call me, I'll come meet you, mm -hmm. um, has a totally different feel than the big house. So the big house is also, it's on a separate property. Um, so there was almost, is autonomy possible under was autonomy possible under slavery? Was there a moment where folks like turned around and looked at these grove of trees and like the wind went by and they experienced a moment of freedom, you know, or got to dream about it? Like that in these cabins that there were children birthed out of joy and not out of like, you know, oppression. And I, so, so those sort of things that are not there, like how does that get woven into design? Um, the belief 
that there was not a, just one story that happened here. And I, I think there are folks who don't know what dramaturgy is at all, but who are guiding the dramaturgical process, mm -hmm. particularly uh, descendants. Um, and then asking black folks in my community if they've ever been to Stagville, um, if not, why not? And what would they need to shift in order to go to visit? Um, like one of my closest friends and collaborator on the process, his name is Derek Beasley. He grew up in Durham, went through all Durham public schools, and he was in his 30s when I brought him there for the project before he had actually been to Stagville. They took him to Duke Plantation, where they talked about the, all that, but they did not bring him here. So I think I'm so curious about what the barriers to people being like, oh, actually, this is history that this is a place I can engage with. This is a place that is mine. This is a so. Um, this is a place where I can find breath and, and know that I am seated here. So I, I think I'm really curious about the ways in which the trees and the air and the way that the grove looks different in spring than it does in winter, how that impacts the way that I am designing space for people to be there in the long term. I, I, can I ask you a follow-up question? <laughs> sure. Um, I um, am really moved by and curious about structurally how um, these plantations across the state of North Carolina are, are um, yeah, are, are marked, are like owned by the state now. Um, and yeah, I'm curious about um, yeah, because that's, that's not the case in a lot of the other states. <laughs> um, and I, I'm, I'm curious about what you, how you understand that, like, more generally for your work with Stagville, but also, like, this, these, these other ceremonies that you were holding in other spaces. Um, like, what does that governance and over oversight, what does that mean for, for you and your process? Yeah. Um, so in North Carolina, um, the folks who are over, there's a black woman who is the head of all of the historic sites. Her name is Michelle Lanier. She yeah. is dope. She's yeah. so dope. Yeah. Um, and she's a descendant mm -hmm. of Stagville. Mm -hmm. But, and she also knows that she's inside of a system and can do, she can do her thing, but she can only do her thing but so much. So like one of the reasons why this is not a monument, this is not a honoring of any people, is because Michelle, during um, all of the uprisings in 2020, and people taking down monuments, they decided to take, she made the decision to take down the Confederate monuments that were surrounding our state capitol. And they were like, okay, but what if you leave them and we'll just like put some monuments up other places? And she's like, no, take them down. Mm -hmm. So because of that, our state legislator then wrote um, there's laws that say that there can be no monuments on any state property. <laughs> so that is why, like, no, 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 this is a reflection space. Mm -hmm. This is a space to reflect. Like, we're just so clear that even though we know this is something, like, we also want to honor the people, it's about reflection mm -hmm. and not about honoring. Mm -hmm. So I think the governance, as much as, like, there are people in power who are shifting things, um, the culture of historic sites it's still to tell a particular story that coddles and, and cares mm -hmm. for particular groups of people. Mm -hmm. And you even see that in like the Instagram. I called them out on Instagram like last year because they put up a post from someplace and they were, it was one of the historic sites and they were like, yeah, and you know, and people worked here and they, they picked the, th and then I was like, did they work or were they enslaved? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I took the screenshot, and, and then Michelle emailed me. She's like, I saw the message you sent to the people because they're all individually run, and they do not actually have a clear mm -hmm. culture on how we talk about these things. Mm -hmm. And some of those folks are so entrenched mm -hmm. and have been doing this for so long that they do not, and they are in counties where they are not challenged around mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, it really, it feels like the work at Stagville for me, one of the values that I hold in my work is like, um, Waves, not craters. Mm -hmm. The work we do at Stagville would then have a ripple effect out mm -hmm. across these other sites of like, actually, you have a responsibility not to these buildings, mm -hmm. not to like the history that's on the paper, but to the living people who are living with the mm -hmm. impact.
impacts of what happened on this land. Talk about it. So, and if we are not doing that, if we are so busy serving, like, we got to preserve the brick, we got to preserve mm -hmm. the da, 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 then, like, what are we doing? Right? Mm -hmm. Because also, inside of climate change, there is no guarantee that one storm that won't come yeah. and destroy all of it yeah. anyway. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, yes. the materiality has to serve the, 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 the people. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yes. Period. Period. Okay. <laughs> Can I answer a little bit? Please, please. Um, the, the dramaturgical process with this, it was a shit process. I don't know how to say that in like a very yeah. way. Yeah. It was the worst process I've ever been a part of. Mm. Um, because I, during ritual, I asked, it was part of my request to the ancestors to take the project off my lap. Like, mm. I did not want to do it. It was very clear from the jump. Like, actually, I don't want to do this. Could you move it? Move it to another time. Move it to another space. I Listen, I put all the things in the ritual. I was like, yeah, this is about to work. I'm about to go back. about to have this conversation. And they'd be like, yeah, you know what this... No. Um, that did not happen. Um, that did not happen. And I feel like it was a spiritual dramaturgical process because the more that the... I had in my mind it would be very cut cut and dry, we're gonna do this like on um, this ritual theater piece on the site. There was no plan to film it, there was no plan to record it, it was not a digital project. I was like boom boom boom. Yeah. <laughs> no. Everything first of all we couldn't even get access to the site because there was stuff going on behind the scenes with this school district mm -hmm. trying to connect with these organizations that are usually like super responsive, like we know people you know everybody not happening. It got pushed back. And even the curator was like, what is happening? Mm. It's almost like like something doesn't want it to happen. Mm. And so it was just like so much questioning that was coming up based on just like, I realized it wasn't blocks. They were forming it into a thing that mm. I didn't get to choose, which I hate. That's mm. not my favorite thing mm. ever. Um, and it wasn't blocks, but it was like, no, not now. Mm -hmm. This, and then I get a new piece of information, and now yeah. I have to get, I have to ask a lot of deep questions, yeah. and then I have to really kind of sit with the elements and be like, okay, I get it. What do you want? What do you want to say about this? And how do I translate that? And it just was a lot of questions, question, question, questions, questions that came up that I don't necessarily always have answers for, even still, because there's no. There are no answers. There's just like process. Um, and when we got the final, even looking at the final product, the curator and I were just like, this is not what we thought this was going to be mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. um, integrating the documentary set, like that wasn't necessarily the way in which we had planned, um, or even us performing on top of the. So there's. Um, Lisa Harris does like this, the vocal scoring. So I sent her my, uh, I sent her the script and just was like, you do. She's amazing. I don't know if you know, she's moving out. She's amazing. Um, but then the idea that like while the documentary, like people are telling these like stories, we're like moving on top of just talking. It just, it just is all the way that it combines. So it was really, um, Allowing like the questions that I felt like these different elemental forces kept presenting just kept changing the piece because once the question got posed then you can't move forward without you know without having to add another layer because now the spirit of water is saying, Well what about there were hundred and seven bodies and why would I wash away five? You know, or seven. I don't know. Like now I gotta go go ask what happened to the other bodies like mm. what so it was really really um poopy mm. i like to be in control that doesn't work well obviously <laughs> i never get that i never get that but this process was the only process that was um so layered that even like i said the curator was like it's very clear like do does this at some point like do they want this to happen like, because, I mean, even, like, where I lived, I get all my Amazon packages. Like, nothing ever gets $900 worth of stuff. 
got delivered to an address, we have no concept of the address where mm. it got delivered. Mm. There's not even another street in the state named my street. Mm. It was like, we filmed, so then it was like, it was like, Spirit was like, no, not even, you can't film the day mm. you film. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you gotta wait. Mm. Like, so I feel like um, it did, it forced me into this constant questioning process about um, process information, mm -hmm. how it's processed, what my role is in, in uh, being a translator, mm -hmm. what, you know, where I step forward, where I step back, how do I allow spirit to move and not get in the way. Um, even when we did the ritual on site, an ancestralization ritual, a white woman who came, it was open to the community. She came, listen, she was in there, it's on the, it's in the film. She was there with this, so everybody grouped by clans according to the Dagara, right? And I helped them understand like, this is what your contributions are typically in ritual, everybody has a role. So people got to be with their clan and like, and, um, and so her part of her clan is, we were ancestralizing. We have the names that we have, right? We're ancestralizing them on site. And this white woman, she was, oh, oh. She was making her song, girl. Making her song. She, oh, we are, oh, we are. I mean, for like seven minutes for the, for the section, right? No. I mean, I'm sorry. God bless her. But yeah, like she was moved, okay? I said, she's going in on this like vocal giving. Right? She was part of the mineral clan, so she was, we care, we love. <laughs> Three in the morning. I'm getting emails, phone calls. I did not give this woman none of this information because it was through the organization. She contacts the organization. She is like, I don't want to be in the film. I woke up. I didn't feel right at three in the morning. Something woke her up. The wrong person was she It was wrong. She goes to my website and she saw the word voodoo. Had a fucking oh. you. You took us through voodoo. Mm. I said we well, don't want you. It's only oh, voodoo, but. They don't want you, even they don't want, they're not coming, did they ask you, do they call, they're not, you might want to talk to your people, your ancestors, we only did it, you should talk to your people, you live here, you live in this city, mm -hmm. I didn't do nothing, but it was just like, it could have been a barrier to the process, because she contacted yeah. the organization, oh. like, we already had her release form though, oh, so yep. it was like, <laughs> yeah. push it through, but, like, <laughs> just the, the, it was like so, the piece is just so many blocks. Like this, it was a lot. It was a lot. And that was at the very end. Anyway, but she's still in there, her voice. Yeah. In the editing, I said, make sure you get that. Baby, it's in there. Um, but just kind of allowing that to like. <laughs> Allowing that to shape and knowing that it wasn't a barrier, like letting the questions that got presented, like, okay, well, what what process is needing to come up? What ritual process would need to continue to unearth this stuff? How would we continue to facilitate that? Like, that was the process for me, like, dramaturgically. And this concept of Oriki that got introduced in one of our calls of, like, um, a birth name, like a birth song, a praise song, um, felt really important for me because the process started to feel like death and not mm. like a birth. Any grief mm. ritual is a birth of joy. Mm. That's really, it's a washing of grief so joy can come back into the village. So having to remember that this isn't a Riki for joy, mm -hmm. at the end of the grief, we will laugh mm -hmm. at this white woman, which we did. <laughs> um, but no, we will laugh in the place where we cried, and that's mm -hmm. the point. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank wow. you for that. Wow. <laughs> wow. Ariel, uh, we would love to hear from you. You heard the original question, correct? I did, I did, yeah. And um, I'm happy to go on to the last speaker because what she said really, really resonates um, in the sense of all the plans that I had um, within this particular project really went in a different direction. Um, in terms of the dramaturgy um, conversations I have with Carlos, he was able to help me think about um, what does it mean to have a trained eye um, when, thi 
when thinking about um, green space, natural space. So coming out from an urban setting, even though I grew up in a rural area, if, if it was to be a return to the land, um, a place where there's farming or there's just wide open space, right? Um, how do you then map out things according to, you know, perhaps what are certain fruit trees? When do they flower? What's in what season? What are the herbs that are available? How are they, how are they used um, to serve the needs of our community, that family? Um, I'm just thinking about natural space in very specific detail. That was one of the things he helped me to consider. Um, not very happy right now. But one of the, what, what um, the last speaker, I'm struggling to remember your name, love. Um, in the vein of things not necessarily going the way I intended for them to go, um, it was interesting, and I, I speak about this more in this afternoon's video, is the idea of um, looking at somebody called Mother Earth and then entering into, unexpectedly somewhat, entering into the, the work and the, the rhythm of maternity. Um, it, this, I, I felt like I, I came towards completing the script and then when I was pregnant and it was a very it was a very difficult pregnancy, challenging on the medical side of things. Um, so from very early I had to go into bed rest, which meant that um, my ability to move, um, this, this, this was supposed to be a movement piece because it's a piece about moving away from. I wanted it to be kind of not, I wouldn't go as far as to call it dance, I'm not a dancer like, like Sanja, but um, incorporating lots of movement, right? Physical movement. And uh, that suddenly became very impossible. So I had to think about, you know, I had to think about movement in different ways and terms. Um, and something that, is it? It's not Larissa, the first speaker, um, all my mother's dream in Spanish, also trying to remember your name. You were talking about having a script with a certain level of porosity. Um, that for me looked like um, being able to break up the script in such a way that even though I didn't get to perform it as one complete production, one single production, um, every time that I would be invited to perform at an event, I would try my best to see if there was a way I could perform part of the script, mm -hmm. if there was a way I could work one of the one of the poems or one of the pieces into that performance, mm -hmm. so that it became this kind of very um, yeah, it, it, it became this broken up thing that I was doing any and everywhere um, as a performance as a, a performance poet. Um, instead of like one theatrical piece, that, that hasn't happened yet for me. Um, so having that adaptability in, in that regard was important for me because uh, like Sistrin was saying, you know, um, you plan, <laughs> you make plans for things and spirit redirects. Um, so definitely I found myself living inside more of the text as I was researching um, this Mother Earth person. For example, one of the elements she speaks about um, is her doing away with the hospital, particularly as it regards to giving birth. Um, and because of the complications of my pregnancy, I had to go to, um, I had to have my birth at a hospital, even though I, I would have preferred to do it at home. Um, and so my interface with the doctors, with the medical staff, um, her story and her narrative kept playing at the back of my mind and I really had to set my boundaries with folks. I really had to make certain demands in terms of what I wanted, what I didn't want for my child. Um, and uh, it, it, it comes, her story comes out of a place of trauma and it just, it just allowed me to really view um, our hospital system here, and I would think, you know, throughout the West, as a really oppressive system, and, and the, the hospital I went to is meant to, is, it is a public hospital, and we have, thankfully, we have free healthcare here, to an extent, um, but it was still really traumatic inside of there, so I felt like in some ways I was still kind of making the journey with Mother Earth. Um, thinking and reconsidering a lot of the things that she brought up in her process and in her journey. Um, and ultimately, I, I give thanks that 
I'm still inside of the script, I'm still moving with her words, I'm still finding truth and resonance in a lot of the things that she came forward with, and um, still exploring, still in that realm of exploration um, with baby and so. for the collective, right? Like our larger body that wants to ask. So this question is really like, how how did your work, how did, how is your work changing you, changed you? Um, and this, you all have really beautifully answered this in so many ways. Um, so just wanna like offer that as maybe a filter um, as we move into also other questions. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, just lifting that filter and then opening the room for questions and opening the panel for questions for each other. I think I was wondering, we've heard of water from Sonja, um, Sonia. and Sonia, sorry, um, and um, earth with Candace. Candace. Mm -hmm. What elements do you all identify your work as representing? That's a great question. Um, all of the elements were elements were another dramaturgy for the piece in a lot of ways. Um, in that, the we kind of tracked which element seemed to I which characters seemed to identify with which elements most. Um, some of that was accidental, some of it was evolutionary, and then it became intentional kind of in the last bits of the process, but the first kind of seed of the piece was locating a lot of the conversation among characters in what for me is an ancestral space, which is a patio of a house in Venezuela that's very much like my family's house, and there's a mango tree there. And so, Mangoes became this this massive kind of cosmology in the world of the play, um, and thus one of the characters kind of became an, an earthbound um, person in terms of element. And then uh, they're you know they're all over the place. It's like this person was fiery, and then the costume designer was like, "Well, I thought they were water, so I made this costume." And I was like, "Oh wow, I think you might be right." So just. I think the elements just were another language that we played with, both visually and also just in terms of actors being able to kind of really get inside the, the bodies of these characters. Can I clarify? So the project engages five elements from the Dagar cosmology. Um, and so that is like mineral. Mineral is the element that archives information. Mm -hmm. So mineral clan people are the artists typically are mineral. I'm interested to see who's I'll tell you. But um so um rocks, gems, that's mineral. Then you have earth, um, is in the girl Tingan Tingbalu. It's a, a female and a masculine presence. So it's nurture and it's protector. It does both. Um, unlike some of how we know in the West, which is like mother only maternal and it's not a fuck you up. Um in Dugar. So there's this duality to it. Uh, water, <clears throat> um, water is the energy of reconciliation. So water bearers are the reconcilers of the people. They keep the peace. Um, they're tasked with creating the wholeness in the community. Um, then there is, let's see, mineral. Uh, then there's nature. So integrating nature also. I linked it with the Congo, I think, in that section. But nature, clan, nature represents anything above the earth. Trees, plants, including humans, all animals, um, including some other uh, beings that are not human as well. They have a, a range of other beings, contomble, that all interface with nature. Um, and nature bearers are considered the natural witches of a the society. They're shapeshifters, the tricksters, 
but they can connect. And then fire, which was really important because fire is the realm of the ancestors. Uh, so integrating fire, and it's not like explicit in there, like earth, fire, mineral, because um, mm -hmm. they all have a different type of ritual connected. Mm -hmm. Fire is the ancestral ritual, which is what we did with the community openly. Um, when you want to talk to the ancestors, that's where you, you go through fire. Some other cosmologies just through water. Uh, is that five? I can't care. I don't do mental math. How many? Water, earth, water, water, water. earth some, 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 and some else. And, <laughs> and then there's five. Yeah, that's five. Okay, cool. Yeah, so it's uh, explicitly five elements that the work connects to. Um, and then five uh, diasporic and practices integrated within those five elements. Yeah, I feel like mine is definitely earth, um, but earth specific specific to earth is trees. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there is mm -hmm. uh, there are just really beautiful trees on the ground. Mm -hmm. There are old trees on the ground, and um, we were very clear that in the design we weren't um, we weren't cutting down any trees. So mm -hmm. all the design is like inside of the grove in which it exists, um, and then the what we're using is like found materials that are already there, so we're not bringing in a lot of materials. Um, and just also, so I really feel like my, my master plan mm -hmm. is that in doing this work, actually, if black folks can heal their relationship to the place of rupture, then we can also step full, more fully into our place inside of um, environmental justice. Mm -hmm. And but, yeah. but the rupture is so real with the earth that it, it it needs a healing, and it needs a healing on plantation spaces is part of my like my thing. Um, and, and so I, thinking about trees, one, the reminder that the trees did not want to harm us. Right. And two, mm -hmm. that the trees are hungry for the specifics of free black breath. Mm -hmm. That like the trees themselves would be different mm -hmm. um, when mm -hmm. black people are breathing freely. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Come on now. <laughs> Juiced up. In each of the sharings, there was a lot around how people outside of the piece were in communication mm -hmm. with it. Um, and I'm thinking about, AZ, this notion of caretaking in particular ways and what does caretaking look like, you said, in the before and the during. And I'm also wondering with Sonia, like, what does that look like afterwards where there are multiple people who are communing? right, um, in ways that are really beyond the scope of how we conceive of our projects, but it reverberates out. So I'm just wondering, in each of your projects, what that sort of looks like. Do you use the word caretaking when you think about the ways in which people outside are communicating in communion with the kinds of topic, spirit, that comes up in your work? Mm. That question was actually from both of us. <laughs> 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 I can actually go first on this one. Um, I think my relationship, our, my the work's relationship to time allows me to be in a caring process. Like this is slow mm -hmm. work. I mean, like I was in conversation with Stagwell for two years before we even got to the contracting. And this wasn't even for the project I wanted to do. This was for the project that they wanted me to do. Like, I'm, I'm still in the process of trying to get to the initial, well, here's the thing that I actually wanted to do with y'all. So I feel very clear that this is a long-term legacy project. Um, also, so I bought a house in uh, 21, and my house sits on Stagville land. Because Stagville was so big. So I think there's also this thing around, like, this is work I'm doing at home, literally. Right? So I think there's something uh -huh. about I am learning how to care for myself and also know that, like, um, the answers has been waiting a long time. Mm -hmm. So even if, you know, I, if that's not happening in one grant cycle or in two years or whatever, that, like, I am not late. Mm -hmm. This work is not late. Good. And we can slow down enough to take care of ourselves and take care of the land and take care of the people as we do this work, um, and that I do not, even, even though sometimes when I think about the possibility of political regime change, mm -hmm. um, and what that would do to the work, I do feel some concern, but I also, I, I trust the ancestors in the land more. That's they're, right. They're That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So. I think for me, 
caretaking, I'm going to echo Candace's desire for control. Um, be, because I, I wear a couple different hats in the theater world, and so I, as a playwright, was really trying to stick to that role. Um, air quotes for our virtual friends. Um, <laughs> But it was it was it was really hard for me. I think more than anything, it answered or gave me more questions about what kind of theater I want to make in the future. Because I think that what happens with an institutional partnership is a question of scale. I just couldn't have produced this play at the scale that that it was produced mm -hmm. on my own. And I think I had to accept that in in getting scale. I had to build certain boundaries for myself around what I can claim as my responsibility. And I think that I just know now that's what it means to have an institutional partner. And I think with each iteration of my work, it's a question of, does this need scale? Or is this small intended just by me? Um, and it also looked like questioning perfectionism, because I think that there were times where I would watch the process of this and ask myself, why did I write anything down? Why is there a right answer? Do you know what I mean? There was something about, you know, and I've made, I've been in so many rehearsal rooms. I've been an actor. I've had off date, off book dates. You know, I've been in the process, but there was something about watching people memorize these words that I wrote that were precise to me, and them getting it wrong, that felt really not okay. Like, it just, it made me ask, like, what are we making when there's a right answer, mm. given the spirit of what this work is supposed to be? Mm. And so ultimately it meant that the actor who stepped into the role um, with the whole visa situation was on book for about a week and a half of the run, and I think that that scandalized the institution. Mm -hmm. And it put my, I had so much peace of mind, because I just was like, I just want the words to mm. get heard, and mm. I want her to feel comfortable. Mm. And ultimately, it was fine. Mm. And I think that was the thing, right? That so, like, beautiful. all yeah. throughout tech, everyone's like, oh, she's holding the script, yeah. what are we gonna do? Like, what wow. if, you know, so that beautiful. interview you do, they're gonna ask, like, why was she holding a script? None of that happened. Mm -hmm. Because there's so many different ways of knowing, and yeah, it was fine. Right. You know what I mean? And I think that that was really the takeaway, that like, mm -hmm. we're allowed to mm -hmm. just do things differently. And then I think the only other thing I would say about caretaking <laughs> is caretaking of audience. We talked about this at dinner last night, too, of, of <laughs> recognizing that I, I wrote a piece where people who do not speak one of these languages will not understand half of what they hear. Yeah. And building other languages into the presentation. So making body language and movement and choreography and ritual elevating them to the same status as text, which yeah. I think just doesn't happen in American yeah. theater very often. Yeah. So that when people didn't understand what they were hearing, there were so many other languages that they could access. And, and just making sure that the audience was getting that message in hundreds of ways from the moment they came into the door. Mm. So that was a lot about, you know, what do we put in the lobby display? The fact that the play morphed into um, having a drum score, and there's a drum, and you'll see in the video later that there's a drummer who was on set throughout the piece, and just the language of percussion being something that is so universal for any human body. So I think that recognizing that that is also caretaking, of just mm -hmm. like offering multilingual, and, and also just I think you know, when you apply the lens of an educator to the theater and thinking about, oh, multiple learners, multiple learning styles, like, if I have a message I want to share with folks, it needs to be heard in more than one way. And, and that just becoming, again, the dramaturgy, yes. in a sense. Yes, yes. Because I did speak to one here, Orisha, and she said, you know, you're doing work that's important for, not just for yourself, it's for the ancestors. Right? You're, do, you're working on their behalf. So even though you're not necessarily an Orisha practitioner, you're working in concert with 
a lot of the spirit world that you have to be um, even though you are doing this for academic reasons you are, you are there's a different level that you're doing this for and she's told me that even about my museum she says you are a teacher you are you are trying to teach people things you're trying to open doors for people so you have to be conscious of that so it's not just about caretaking it's about taking care mm -hmm. So that you have to, you have to understand what, be in conversation, and be aware of what people in this realm and uh, and the spirits of other realms are telling you. Yeah, right. Even though it's an academic exercise, at the end of the day, because it's part of my work for my PhD, it's really a, it's beyond that. A PhD is a piece of paper. Okay. Um, what you trying, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to search for certain truths. And that is a whole different realm. Yeah. So that I try now to walk through the world with that kind of um, sort of philosophy in mind. So that when I do approach even the academic things, I'm looking at a document or whatever. Because I'm a very, you know, I have an MBA. So I, I'm, I'm all about, got to get the facts, got to get the facts, got to get the facts. You know, how many people came, how many people got lost. Because it mm -hmm. actually does exist now in a sense. Mm -hmm. The Duke University did a very massive project about that. But beyond, but that's not really important. Mm -hmm. What's really important is what the felt history is, as mm -hmm. I say, right? Mm -hmm. And what it is that we carry mm -hmm. with us, mm -hmm. and how does that help us heal for the future? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where my caretaking and taking care. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I want to turn to Ariel <laughs> um, to hear responses. Right. Well. So can y'all hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, wait, hold on. Can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, just extending what I was saying earlier on um, caretaking, I had to tend to my body, I had to prioritize rest, um, which I am so grateful. Um, I think this has been one of the few organizations that I've done work with in the last few years where there was so much, what is it when I'm looking for? Spaciousness and graciousness in process. Um, where I did have that freedom without feeling, you know, continually pressured that I needed to meet a deadline um, with this work. Um, and so at some point I was ready to perform the piece on my bed and record it and do it as a film. <laughs> and that's where I had gotten to at one point. Um, but what I was able to do was just kind of, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a possible moment while I get my body back up and running. And, and I, again, I speak about this more later on. Um, so that is caretaking on my part in terms of the people that I call kin, the people who I refer to as tribe, um, who I have been in conversation about this work with. Um, just, you know, it's, it's as simple as being intentional about the communities that I become part of, being intentional about um, how are we providing for each other, how, how am I gifting you seeds, how are you giving me a plant um, for my garden, how are we sustaining each other, taking fruits to each other's homes, discussing how we're going to homeschool our children together, um, what's our groups about, you know, just about anything um, in, in, in the realms of organizing and caretaking. Collective, collective aid, really. Um, how do we continue to find ways to forge that interdependence um, as we release our hold on the state, as we decentralize from the ways that we've constantly been told are the ways to exist in space, um, particularly in a post space like the Caribbean. So, yeah, my. Caretaking is is continual, continuous community organizing, um, which starts with my own family, with my own part, and um, radiates upward. So, and, and in terms of the, the, the question on um, elemental things, well, um, primarily, well, the central figure that I'm, I'm whose life I'm examining is Mother Earth, and it does have a lot of the farming and the land and um, sustainably living. Uh, something as simple as machete. She didn't she didn't believe in using machetes to cultivate the land, planting. Um, mm -hmm. 
gently, though I know we will move into lunch and continue to be in this conversation. Um, but for this space, this gathering, I want to give thanks to each of you for your brilliance, for your power, for your work. Thank you. 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 Thank you.